Hey guys, it's Skybird here, and I wanted to chat for a handful of minutes about uh, uh, some questions that were asked in the video I made about sort of filling holes in pieces before you cast them. Before I address those questions, though, I have something in my eye. Um, I wanted to go ahead and say that no, the Komal mold is not ready. It did unfortunately fail. Um, I ran into an issue with the clay where it actually rolled sideways uh, about 30-ish minutes in, so it allowed the silicone to actually sit at an off angle, which uh, left a part of a hole unfilled. That's not an issue. That you can fix just by literally pouring more silicone in and just rebalancing the piece. Um, but the actual issue I ran into, and the reason I scrapped it, is I still ran into cure inhibition issues with the clay. So I am going to try more brands of clay in the future. At some point, I will also invest in more expensive but widely regarded brands of silicone as well, something like Alumilite or Smooth-On. I really like the properties of the silicone that I'm using currently, but I also understand that um, it does have some issues. And that's partially what you get for buying something that doesn't have the same kind of maybe standard of quality as a brand like Alumilite or a brand like uh, smooth on or you know other brands out there as well that don't have that same notoriety um so one of the questions that i was asked was why not use tape instead of clay to actually fill holes and masks and you can um however it's a lot more situational so for example for this mahiki mask which i made here um i actually did a a piece of tape over the eyes itself when filling the holes in the eyes here. And the reason it works on the Mahiki mask is there's only a very gentle change in angle from the forehead, which slopes inward slightly, to the, the bottom of the face, which is mostly flat. And tape can handle that reasonably well. However, when it comes to a mask like the Rao here, which has this sort of heavy brow overhang, on the actual surface of the mask that would mean that the tape would have to go over the eye but then bend at a 90 degree angle to even hit that uh that surface there and there's not a lot of surface there for the, the for the tape to even adhere to so it could come apart rel relatively easily especially with the weight of silicone on top of it but also it curves compound it actually curves outward which means not only would i need to have a 90 degree bend in the tape but that bend would have to curve as well. And tape does not really enjoy doing that kind of stuff very much. There are certain kinds of tape out there that are flexible that can be more used in scenarios like this, but there are other masks like this Matatu here where getting tape even in there in the first place requires some very precise cutting. You might take 10 minutes putting the tape on a mask, and at that point, if I could just rub a piece of clay over those holes and call it done, that's a much easier solution in my opinion. Clay is less restrictive because it's a freeform object. And also clay, uh, there, there are clays specifically designed for silicone because um, silicone mold making is an industry in and of itself. It's not just something that craft and hobby people do, but it is used by Hollywood, it is used by prop companies and stuff like that. It is used for prototyping, it is used for a lot of stuff out there. And because of that, when you're making something like a two-part mold, which usually requires clay in its in its uh, uh, usual use case, not every time, there are certain types you can do, but we're not going to get into pedantics here. Um, oftentimes, the reason clay is used in those two-part molds is for consistency, and so there are clays specifically developed for uh, uh, use with silicone that you can easily get your hand on. You can go and buy. You can search on Amazon silicone-free, you know, or sulfur-free. Uh, clays, sulfur free, not silicone free. Um, and then you can obviously go from there. Uh, one of the things I wanted to go ahead and mention as well uh, regarding the question that was asked was also they had suggested uh, using painter's tape and they said um, that it essentially completely negates or, or removes the ability for cure inhibition. Um, and that's not technically true. So it's when it comes to cure inhibition, one of the things you need to know is your brand is really important because every brand of tape, for example, is very different. Part of the reason for this is because of patents. If every brand created the exact same kind of tape, they'd be, you know, infringing on each other's patents. So often they put in proprietary blends of adhesive. Their adhesives have little changes in them so that they can patent different. Anyway, it doesn't matter. The point with this is that a lot of brands uh, of tape, other types of adhesive actually use sulfur in the adhesive to help stabilize it but sulfur does not mix with silicone cure uh sil or with platinum cure silicone i'm tripping over my words here if you can't tell 
And so because of that, you'll actually run into certain issues with some brands of tape. Your brand may work for you, but other brands may not. Um, and this is actually specifically a problem that I already came across online because when I was doing the research, one of the first things that came up, I believe on Reddit, was someone had actually asked why their silicone is not curing against painter's tape specifically. Um, so there are brands out there when it comes to tape that will react with silicone and there are brands of silicone that will react with tape. And it's all different. So you just got to kind of play around, do some trial and error. Or if you haven't done it, uh, go on to th something like Reddit or something like YouTube. There are millions of people out there that do resin casting, that do uh, that mo do mold work in general, that have already experienced how different brands react. And you'll usually be able to find through those people, through their experiences, sort of what brands work, right? Again, a lot of the time, these larger, more well-known brands, you're not really going to run into any major issues with them. But with, you know, lesser known or cheaper brands, you might still come out with a quality product, but you might run into more issues in terms of cross compatibility between brands. So just important to know. Another question that was asked of me um, by another uh, subscriber, which thank you guys, by the way, um, is why would I bother cleaning up the inside of the mask in the first place if you're not going to see it? And that is a good question. If you're doing this as a hobby just for yourself, do whatever you like. If you like the masks to be unclean on the inside, don't worry about it. You know, it only takes a couple of minutes to clean up masks most of the time. But yes, when you're doing this at like sort of a production scale, every single mask cleaning every single piece, all that time adds up on the end, right? So uh, to mainly answer your question is that I intend on actually providing several of the masks that I make, several of the pieces that I make to the community. And so I want to hold myself to a specific standard of quality so that when someone buys a product from me, they know exactly what they're getting. They know what to expect next time or if they recommend me to somebody else. And so in those cases, when it comes to like a color matched piece, for example, if I create a piece in dark turquoise or lime or whatever, I would like for the piece to as closely reflect an official Lego piece as possible. It does not mean it needs to be necessarily identical, uh, but it is important to me at the very least. Another reason why you might want to make sure the inside of your pieces is clean is if you're casting transparent pieces, because any issues that show up on the inside of the mask are also going to be seen on the outside. You can think of it like a window. If you scratch the outside of your window, you're going to see it. But if you paint the window black, you won't see the scratch anymore, but it's still on the outside of the window, right? It's still there. It hasn't gone away. And that's kind of the same thing here. Um, so that's the main reason. Now, when it comes to fun casts, stuff like this, this is about experimentation. This is not about the quality of whatever comes out of there. I still like the pieces to be high quality, of course. Um, but the whole point of doing fun casts is basically keeping yourself from going insane. I've decided this pretty early on that I'm basically going to take one day a week to just try to experiment, just do fun stuff, right? Don't worry about trying to match Lego colors. That can be a lot of pressure. And if you get something that's a little bit off, it, it discourages you, right? So if you take one day a week to just mix up some colors and do whatever you want with it, right? Mix things, do whatever, even if it's not supposed to work. Sometimes it's going to come out a complete failure. Sometimes you'll get really cool pieces. My personal favorite, I think, from uh, yesterday's fun cast is this one right here. It looks absolutely incredible. It's a trans black with trans orange on there, but it also glows green. All of the orange sections glow in the dark green, which is super cool. You can see it on the high edges of the little like chin protrusion. I don't even know what that's called. And it, it's such a neat mask. And this was more or less a proof of concept. It's not a perfect piece. The actual mold had warped when I had cast this. So there's a mark on the inside of the mask. And if I was going to market this item to uh, a person, for example, I want to make note of that. But that's not as important for a mask like this because this is not designed to match anything from Lego in either color or quality, right? This is just designed to be a functional piece that looks really goddamn cool. <laughs> and it does that. It does that job well. But when it comes to, you know, casting a mask in white or dark turquoise or something like that, if I have the ability to make my mold lines invisible or to remove vent marks wherever I can or keep them in places where it just makes sense for them to be, that's huge, right? Because that is the type of quality that I want to give out to my customers. Um, so, yeah, I think that that is a very important question. Um, a another question that I wanted to address was essentially... Why bother sharing these details? Why not, you know, keep this stuff a secret? And um, I think there is a lot of value in actually teaching others sort of as you go along. As you guys know, I'm having a lot of fun doing this kind of stuff 
And uh, part of the reason for that fun is that I get to sort of experiment along with you guys, but also I get to document the process so that you don't feel like it's such a daunting process yourself. And that way, if you wanted to get into this stuff in your future, you absolutely can. It is an initial investment, of course, but once that kind of stuff is out of the way, you'll be very pleased with some of the results you'll have. You'll also be let down by some of the results, and that's something that you have to expect. Sometimes things aren't going to work perfectly, and that's another reason why I think those fun casts, pardon me, why I think those fun casts are worth uh, worth their weight, honestly. Um, so the other reason I don't really consider this as like a secret industry or anything like that is because, again, there are millions of people out there in the world that do resin casting currently. You can look up dozens of videos when it comes to sort of what types of molds to do with this to you know how to mix your resin etc how to do cool things um and so there is plenty of information out there to go around uh but there's really only you know a handful of people resin casting in the bionicle uh adjacent community as well in the lego community as well and so because of that i think people sort of see it as maybe this um fantastical you know, uh, like like this out there thing that they can never achieve. And that's not really true because resin casting is pretty similar across the board. It's not all the same. There are different types of molds that are good for different things. In most cases and in the future, I'll be using things like two-part molds as well. But I like kind of where I'm going with things because it affords me the opportunity to experiment and try new stuff. Currently, um, a lot of casters that I've seen out there are sort of um, doing very similar things, which works, obviously. It has very clearly worked uh, to create products that are satisfying, that are high quality, and that I would recommend. Um, but I don't see as much experimentation in this field in terms of uh, experimenting with different types of molds, experimenting with different mixtures of things, and just kind of having fun with it. And I think there is a, like I said, a value to that. And it also helps to make the process feel a little less daunting and feel a little more approachable for people. Uh, remember, I've only been doing this for about a week and a half, getting close to two weeks here. And um, I think I've progressed relatively quickly. I'm super happy with the process and the products that I've been creating. And from the moment that I pulled the first piece out of the pressure pot, I knew that this was going to be something for me. Not only does resin casting really play into my strengths because of certain character traits that I have, um, but it's a fairly approachable process for most people. And so long as you take the proper safety uh, considerations into or sa safety concerns into consideration, uh, you can enjoy yourself. You know, you're going to pull things sometimes that don't look quality. Um, uh, and a perfect example of that is this white matatu here which looks pretty cool but it has some infiltration some parts of other things got inside of it and i do a pretty vigorous uh cleaning process when it comes to my mold itself but sometimes that's going to happen and i actually learned via that process that there's actually a static charge involved that can pull things in which is goofy it's not something i ever would have expected until i saw it happen in front of my own eyes and i was like oh that's neat it's unfortunate in this case but it also means it's something I can remember for the future if I want to do some really interesting and fun experiments, which I plan on doing. Um, so as you guys saw, this is basically my first week where I did fun cast, but you can expect that uh, to come more. Uh, the fun cast items that I decide to put up for sale will probably go for sale maybe like the end of the month. Some of those items are obviously going to be things I keep. Some are going to be failures as well. Um, but some of them will be items that other people are like, oh, I want that whenever it's ready to, you know, to go out. And, uh, yeah, I also want to be able to do that kind of stuff for you guys as well. I've already had a lot of people asking me about a handful of these fun casts. This one here, of course, um, I may keep this one if I can't replicate it just because I am in love with the finished product here. Um, but at the same time, I'm more than happy to try and create more of those. I know I can't create the exact blend that I did because again, it's just a fun cast. It's not about any of the small stuff, but little things like this with the, uh, sparkle blue to sparkle black to sparkly orange that glows in the dark green. Uh, it's silly stuff, right? It's just kind of, Hey, these are all the mixes I have in front of me right now. Let's just pour them all together kind of thing and it, yeah, it's a lot of fun i really enjoy it i enjoy sharing the information with you guys and like i said i see a lot of value in it clearly you guys see the value too 
I've gained uh, a handful of subscribers just because of the resin casting that I've been doing, uh, and I hope to continue to do so. I hope to continue to grow so that more eyes can see this process and more people can see it as freeing rather than constricting, rather than uh, something that's either impossible to do or uh, is too restrictive, too limiting. Um, so that's pretty much it for this video. If you guys did enjoy the video, make sure to leave a like and subscribe. I know it's a little bit of a longer one. I apologize for that. Uh, tried not to sniffle too much. I've had a, I don't know, runny nose like all day long. But uh, yeah, as always, my links will be in the description below. You can go ahead and check those out. And of course, make sure to like and subscribe if I didn't say it already. See y'all in the next one. Take care.